Hello, brothers and sisters. It is a wonderful day to study the Word of God. I invite you all to join me in exploring through the Bible. As believers, we have all undergone or will go through the test of faith. And those that we face may not be the same as others. At such times, we may think we are fighting a lonely battle. But remember, God will always be our compass to guide us through the perilous sea. He will provide us with a way out, just as He provided a ram for Abraham's sacrifice. As I have mentioned in our previous study, Scripture is full of examples on the test of faith to encourage us on our spiritual exams. So let us continue to learn more from those who were successful before us in our tests of faith. But in the meantime, before we begin our journey, let us have a quick recap of what we learned in our previous episode. First, we witnessed how Abraham succeeded in his test of faith and learned that despite his anxiety to sacrifice his son, he obeyed God and was even ready to kill him, which we observed by his raised dagger until an angel stopped him. And we also learned that the mountain where Abraham made the sacrifice might lie in the same ridge where Christ sacrificed himself to free us of our sins. Secondly, we observe God reaffirming his promises to Abraham, which included the Messiah to come. And finally, we were informed of Sarah's death and understood the reason behind why Abraham bought a burial ground, despite him owning the land of Canaan and its future purpose. Now that we discussed in depth the purpose of the burial place of Sarah, don't you want to know how the transaction took place between Abraham and Ephron? And what are God's plans for Isaac? How is he going to fulfill his promises through him? Well, friends, our journey with Abraham is about to end. So let us meet up with Abraham for one last time and learn from his faith. Welcome, dear friends, to yet another episode of Through the Bible. Let's continue to witness the faith of Abraham as he handles both the death of Sarah and the marriage plans of Isaac. God bless you as you listen. Abraham now makes a deal to buy the cave. Notice the transaction. Genesis 23, 10-12 And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered, Abraham, in the audience of the children of Heth, even of all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my lord, hear me, the field give I thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people give I it thee, bury thy dead. And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land. Notice Abraham and the generosity of these people and of the man Ephron in particular. They certainly were polite in that day. We have the impression that these were cavemen who carried clubs around ready to club each other. If Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and the other Old Testament were in a big city today and could go back and report to their folk, I think they would say, do you know that our offspring are a bunch of cavemen? They're highly uncivilized. They are rude and crude and a disgrace. I think they would say that of us. But we have an advantage that we can talk about them. It is interesting to note how polite they are. And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land. Genesis 23, 13-16 And he spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field. Take it off me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, my Lord, hearken unto me, the land is worth four hundred shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, four hundred shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. That is, Abraham paid for the field and cave in the legal tender of that day. Genesis 23, 17-20 And the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field, and the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field, that were all the borders around about, were made sure. Unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth, before all that went in at the gate of his city. After all this, Abraham buried Sarah his wife in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for the possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. 
Apparently, this place is where the mosque is built at Hebron today. He is considered either the second or third most important mosque in the world of Islam. They have many mosques in Cairo and other places and the ones I have seen are absolutely beautiful. The most important one, of course, would be at Mecca. I am not sure whether the one at Hebron or the one at Jerusalem would be number two, but the other would be number three. You can see how important this is, because the Arabs all trace their lineage back to Abraham. Chapter 24 We have come in chapter 24 to a major break in the second division of Genesis. The first division, chapter 1 to 11, deals with four great events. The second and final division, chapters 12 to 50, deal with four outstanding individuals. Specifically, in Genesis 12 to 23, we have Abraham, the man of faith. Now, in chapter 24 to 26, we have Isaac, the beloved son. There are three great events in the life of Isaac and we have already seen two of them. The first was his birth and the second was him being offered by Abraham. The third is the obtaining of his bride. They say there are three great events in a man's life, his birth, his marriage and his death. And that he has no choice except with the second one, marriage. Sometimes a man doesn't seem to have much choice in that connection either. But nevertheless, these are the three great events in man's life. We come now to the story of how Isaac secured his bride. Abraham sends his trusted servant back to the land of Haran in Mesopotamia to get a bride for Isaac. And we will see the success of the servant in securing Rebekah. This is a very wonderful love story. It reveals that God is interested in the man whom you marry, young lady, and he is interested in the young lady whom you marry, young man. There are two institutions that God has given to the human family. One is marriage and the other is human government. God permits man to rule himself today. These are two universal and very important institutions. When these are broken, a society will fall apart. The home is the backbone of any society. God knew that and he established marriage, intending that it gives strength and stability to society. The same thing is true relative to human government. A government must have the power to take human life in order to protect human life. That is the purpose of it, because human life is sacred. God gave such laws. The point here is that God is interested in your love story and it is wonderful when you bring God into it. The first miracle that our Lord performed was at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. I do not know how many weddings we went to, but he went to that one. The 24th chapter of Genesis is one of the richest sections of the word of God because it tells a love story that goes back to the very beginning. A very dramatic account is given here of the way that a bride was secured for Isaac and again, a fantastic spiritual picture is also presented to us. There are two things that I want you to notice as we go through this chapter. One is the leading of the Lord in all the details of life of those involved. It is a remarkable statement that is made time and time again Oh, how God led even in these early days, there were those in that social climate who were looking to God and following his leading. Some would have us believe that this took place in the Stone Age, when man was a caveman and pretty much uncivilized. Don't believe a word of it. Here is a record that shows that man did not start out as that kind of man at all. And we find here the leading of God. If God could lead in the lives of these folk, he can lead in your life and my life. The second thing to notice in this chapter is the straightforward manner in which Rebecca made her decisions to go with the servant and become the bride of Isaac. This is a tremendous thing which we will notice as we go through. Genesis 24.1 And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham is old, well stricken in age, and the Lord has blessed him in all things. Abraham now wants to get a bride for his own son Isaac. But he does not want to get a bride among the Canaanites where the people are given to idolatry and paganism. And so he will send his servant to his people back in the land of Haran to get a bride for Isaac. Genesis 24 And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. This is the way men took an oath in that day. They did not raise their right hands and put their left hands on a Bible. They didn't have a Bible to begin with, and frankly I do not think it is necessary for anyone to put his hand on a Bible to swear that he is telling the truth. If he intends to lie, he will lie even if his hand is rested on the Bible. The method in that day was for a man to put his hand under the thigh of the man to whom he was going to make an oath. I think this servant was Eliezer. He was the head servant in the home of Abraham, and he had a son. Remember that Abraham had called God's attention to that earlier in Genesis 15, 2-3. 
Genesis 24:3 And I will make thee swear by the Lord and God of heaven and the God of the earth and thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell My Christian friend if you have a boy or girl in your home who is marriageable you ought to pray that he will not marry one of the Canaanites they are still in the land and there is always a danger of our young people marrying one of them if they do as someone has put it they are going to have the devil for their father-in-law and they are always going to have trouble with him Genesis 24:4 to 6 But thou shall go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac And the servant said unto him For adventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest And Abraham said unto him Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again In other words the servant says to Abraham suppose i cannot find a girl who will come with me shall i come back and get isaac to take him to that land and abraham says never take isaac back this is the place where god wants us do not return him to that land under any circumstances this is very important for us to see genesis 24:7 the lord god of heaven which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and which spake unto me and that swear unto me saying unto thy seed will i give this land he shall send his angel before thee and thou shall take a wife unto my son from thence abraham is really a man of faith he demonstrates it again and again and here he is magnificent he says to this servant you can count on god to lead you god has promised me this abraham is not taking a leap in the dark faith is not a leap in the dark it must rest upon the word of god many people say i believe god and it will come to pass that's fine it is wonderful for you to believe god but do you have something in writing from him abraham always asked for it in writing and he had it in writing from god god had made a contract with abraham abraham is really saying god has promised me that through my seed isaac he is going to bring a blessing to the world you can be sure of one thing god has a bride back there for isaac you see abraham rests upon what god has said we need to not be foolish today faith is not foolishness it is resting upon something it is always reasonable it is never a leap in the dark it is not betting your life that this or that will come to pass it is not a gamble it is a sure thing faith is the real sure thing abraham is sure genesis 24:8 and if the woman will not be willing to follow thee then thou shall be clear from this my oath only bring not my son thither again abraham says don't ever take my son back there but if the woman won't come then you are discharged what does that mean I think it means simply that Abraham would have told you God has another way of working this out. I don't know what it will be, but I'm very sure that God does not want my son to marry a godless girl. My friend, that is what faith is. Faith is acting upon the word of God. Faith rests upon something. God wants us to believe his word and not just believe. It is pious nonsense to think that you can force God to do something. That God has to do it because you believe it. Dr. Vernon Maggie has made it through a number of years now with cancer in his body and no one wants to be healed more than him. Let not any man tell him that he does not believe in faith in healing. He does. However, he has been told that he can force God that God will heal him if he demands it. We do not know what his will is, but whatever his will is, that is what everyone should want done. God wants us to bring our needs to him but he has to be the one to determine how he will answer our prayers. Abraham has something to rest upon. He is not demanding anything of God. He says, if this doesn't work out then God has another way to work it out. Genesis 24:9 And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swore to him concerning that matter. Now watch the servant as he goes out to get a bride for Isaac. Genesis 24:10 And the servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hand and he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor the servant who is going to Mesopotamia to get a bride for Isaac takes 10 camels along and that means somebody had to ride them he took along quite a retinue of servants for all the goods of his master were in his hand in other words he had charge of all the chattels and all the possessions of Abraham Genesis 24:11 and he made his camels to kneel down before the city by a well of water at the time of the evening even the time that women go out to draw water 
It may seem strange to you that the women came out to draw water, but they were the ones who did the watering of the camels in that day. Very frankly, women did lots more work in those days than they do today. I mean by that hard physical labor. The women were the ones who watered and took care of the stock. The men were supposed to be out trading and doing other work. They were always loafing by any means. But it is interesting to note that it was the custom of that day for women to go out to draw water. The servant was waiting because it was not the proper thing for him as a stranger to water his camels before the others who lived in that community. This servant is depending upon God. Abraham had put all of this in the hands of the Lord and now the servant does also. Genesis 24:12 to 14. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water and let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say let down thy pitcher I pray thee that I may drink and she shall say drink and I will give thy camels drink also let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac and thereby shall I know that thou hast shewed kindness unto my master the servant's prayer is something like this The daughters of the men of the city will be coming out I do not know which one to choose and it is just left up to me to pick up one of them I pray that the one that I pick up might be the one that you pick in other words he calls upon the lord to lead him in making the right choice who do you think he is going to pick well he is a man and he is going to pick the best looking woman who comes out and you can be sure of one thing Rebecca was good looking the puritans had the idea that beauty was of the devil The devil is beautiful. He is an angel of light by the way, but he does not have it all. After all, God is the creator, and you have never seen a sunset or looked at a beautiful flower that he did not make. He makes women beautiful, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm sure this man is going to pick the best looking one who comes out. He'd be a pretty poor servant if he didn't. Let's close here, dear brothers and sisters. We hope you have had a blessed time even as we see the faith of Eliezer. in deciding for his master's son god bless you well friends i hope you enjoyed today's study of through the bible i hope you understand what god means when he says ask me anything you want god does provide us with all our needs but we must refrain from our never ending list of demands it is not wrong to ask god for something but we should not force him to satisfy our requests instead We need to give the final decision to him. God knows what we need even before we ask him, and he will provide us with the best. Sometimes our requests may not be the right thing for us, but do not worry. In his time, he will give us something much better than we could have imagined. So as we come to a close, remember, whenever you ask God for something, wait patiently for him to guide you. All that God wants from us is to trust his plans for our life and for what he has promised he will fulfill. We know that Eliezer the head servant had asked God to reveal the chosen bride for Isaac in a specific manner. So what do you think will be God's response? Will God send Isaac's bride as requested or will he do it in his way? Let us wait along with Eliezer and find out God's reply in the next episode of Through the Bible. So stay tuned and God bless you. Mm-hmm.